appreciate being uh, before you this evening. I would like to talk to you tonight about the cost of joy. In Galatians, the uh, fifth chapter, verses 22 and 23, it reads there, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and so forth. Against us there is no law. Joy, then, is a fruit of the Spirit. But exactly what is biblical joy? And what does it cost to obtain this joy? Well, joy is that happy state that results from knowing and serving God. Several Greek and Hebrew words are used in the Bible to convey the ideas of joy and rejoicing. We have the same situation in English with such nearly synonymous words as joy, happiness, pleasure, delight, gladness, merriment, felicity, and enjoyment. The words joy and rejoice are the words used most often to translate the Hebrew and Greek words into English. Joy is found over 150 times in the Bible, and she includes such words as joyous and joyful, the number comes to over 200. And the verb form, rejoice, appears well over 200 times. Joy is the fruit of a right relation with God. It is not something people can create solely by their own efforts. It must involve God. The Bible distinguishes, distinguishes joy from pleasure. The Greek word for pleasure is the word from which we get our English word, hedonism, the philosophy of self-centered pleasure-seeking. Paul referred to false teachers as lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, 2 Timothy 3, verse 4. The Bible warns the self-indulgent pleasure-seeking, uh, or that self-indulgent pleasure-seeking does not lead one to happiness and fulfillment. Ecclesiastes, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11, records the sad testimony of one who sought to build his life on pleasure seeking. The search left him empty and disillusioned. Proverbs 14, chapter, verse 13, offers insight into this way of life. Even in laughter, it reads, the heart may sorrow. Cares, riches, and pleasures rob people of the possibility of fruitful living. Luke 8, verse 14. Pleasure-seeking often enslaves people in a vicious, vicious cycle of addiction. Titus 3, verse 3. The self-indulgent person, according to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, is dead while seeming to be alive. Many people embrace the lie that God seeks to exclude, extinguish, or diminish joy. Quite the contrary, God himself knows joy and he wants his people to know joy. Psalms, 104th Psalm, verse 31, speaks of God himself rejoicing in his creative works. Isaiah, the 65th chapter, verses 18 and 19, speaks of God rejoicing over his Redeem people who will be to him a joy. A significant biblical reference to God's joy is found in the 15th chapter of Luke. The Pharisees and scribes had criticized Jesus for receiving sinners and eating with them. Then Jesus told three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the loving father. The explicit theme of each parable is joy over one sinner who repents. The joy of God came uh, clearly into focus in Jesus Christ. The note of joy and ex exultation runs throughout the entire biblical account of the coming of Christ. Luke 1, uh, first chapter Luke, uh, verse 14 and 44, Matthew the second uh, chapter, verse 10 and so forth. 
the most familiar passage is the angel's announcements of good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Luke, second chapter, verse 10. Jesus spoke of his own joy and the full joy he had come to bring to others. In John, the, fifth, the 15th chapter, verse 11, and the 17th chapter, verse 13. He illustrated the kingdom of heaven by telling of the joy of a man who found treasure, Matthew 13, chapter, verse 44. Zacchaeus was in a tree when Jesus called him, but he quickly climbed down and received Jesus joyfully, Luke 19, chapter, verse 6. He had found life's ultimate treasure in Christ. As Jesus' death approached, he told his followers that soon they would be like a woman in labor, whose sorrow would be turned into joy. John 16, chapter verses 20 and 22 through 22. Later they understood this when the dark sorrow of the cross gave way to the joys of the resurrection. Luke 24th chapter verse 41. Eventually they came to see that the cross itself was necessary to, for the joy to become real. Hebrews 12th chapter verse 2. Because of his victory and the promise of his abiding presence, the disciples could rejoice even after the Lord's ascension. Luke 24th chapter verse 52. The book of Acts tells how joy continued to characterize those who followed Jesus. After Philip preached in Samaria, the people believed and there was great joy in that city. Acts 8 verse 8. Upon being baptized, the Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing, Acts 8, verse 39. After the work of Paul and Barnabas in Antioch of Pisidia, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, Acts 13, chapter verse 52. Paul and Barnabas reported such conversions to other believers, and they caused great joy to all the brethren, Acts 15, 15 chapter verse 3 and after the conversion of the Philippian jailer he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household Acts 16 chapter verse 34 the joy in the Christian life is in direct proportion uh, as believers walk with the Lord they can rejoice because they they're in the Lord Philippians 4 verse 4 Joy is a fruit of a spirit-filled life, Galatians uh, verse 5, 22, which we read. Sin in a believer's life robs a person of joy, Psalms 15, 51st Psalm, verses 8 and 12. When a person walks with the Lord, the person can continue to rejoice even when troubles come. Jesus spoke of those who could rejoice even when persecuted and killed, Matthew the 5th chapter, verse 12. Paul wrote of rejoicing and suffering because of the final fruit that would result. Romans 5th chapter, verses 3 through 5. Both Peter and James also echoed, echoed the Lord's teaching about rejoicing in troubles. 1 Peter, 1st uh, chapter, 6 through 8, and then James, 1st chapter, verse 2. Joy in the Lord enables people to enjoy all that God has given. They rejoice in family, Proverbs 5.18. Food, 1 Timothy 4, verses 4 and 5. Celebrations, Deuteronomy the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 15. Fellowship, Philippians 4th chapter, verse 1. They share with other believers the joys, joys and sorrows of life. As we read in Romans the 12th chapter, verse 15, rejoice with them that do rejoice, weep with them that weep. So it is right and proper to emphasize the joy that is unique to the faithful Christian. But there is another aspect that should be emphasized as well. That is the cost of joy. In talking to his disciples before his crucifixion, Jesus said, as the Father loved me, I, have, I also have loved you. Abide my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, 
These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be may remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. John 15 chapter verses 9 through 12. For joy to prevail in our lives, we must keep his commandments. But he also told his disciples, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. And if you were the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. 15 chapter John, verses 18 and 19. <clears throat> And in his second letter to Timothy, the apostle Paul wrote, Yes, and all, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy, third chapter, verse 12. So, it is significant and appropriate for Jesus to make the following statement as recorded in Luke 14, chapter, verses 26 and 27. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There are two conditions stated here that would disqualify one from being a disciple of Christ. The first is that he must hate his family. The second is he must deny himself, that is, crucify himself, which uh, clears the way for him to follow Jesus. And then, that's the following. To understand this, it is necessary to explore the kind of hate Jesus enjoins on his disciples. The Greek word translated hate indeed does mean that intense or passionate dislike or loathing of a person or thing. However, in this passage, the word is used comparatively. Far from hating those close to us, Jesus called on us to love even our enemies, Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 43 through 48, and to honor our parents, Mark, seventh chapter, verses 9 through 13. He spoke against anger and hatred of one's brother and likened it to a kind of murder, Matthew, the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 26. Husbands are told to love their wives even as Christ loved the church, Ephesians 5.25. Christians are expected to cultivate a sincere love of the brethren and to love one another fervently with a pure heart, 1 Peter, the first chapter, verse 22. We may indeed love the Lord too little, but we cannot love our brethren too much. We shall never love the Lord more by loving our human friends less. Therefore, it must be that a disciple is to hate his relatives and friends in the same sense that he hates himself. He must hate whatever is contrary to the gospel of Christ whenever such contraries, contrariness is found in him, friends, or family. Whatever is pure and right, he is to love. Whatever is unclean and self-indulgent, he is to hate. If family or friends comes between himself and Christ, if a choice must be made between natural affection and devotion to Christ, then true disciples must be ready to treat their family and dearest friends as hated enemies. So therefore, the passage in Luke quoted above means that our love for our Lord is so far above our love to the dearest here in this present life then by comparison, we hate, and put that in quotes, we hate our family and friends. The passage in Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 34 through 39, particularly verse 37, further illustrates this point. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set man against his father, a daughter against his, her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemy shall be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, can't be the disciple. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, can't be his disciple. And who who does not take his cross and follow 
after me is not worthy of me. One must deny himself. He who finds his life will lose it, and who loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus follows the invocation to hate with two counting the cost statements, which emphasize the cost of discipleship. First, Luke 14, chapter verses 28 through 30. For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Last, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, and all who see it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. And the second one is uh, the following uh, two verses. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever you, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. In verses 26 and 27, there were two things cited that would prevent one from being a disciple of Christ. Here in verse 33 is a third item. If Jesus' stern conditions of discipleship are regarded as determinants to superficial inducements, they may alternatively be regarded as challenges to those whose ambition it is to live an active and devoted life in service to our Lord. Jesus does not mince words. He was uncompromisingly honest. He did not keep back the difficulties and dangers from those he sought to enlist in his service. He wanted no one to come after him under any illusions. Men would have to face up to the realities of the task or not follow him at all. Jesus taught, uh, taught that one must count the cost if he is to be his disciple. In the case of the builder of the tower or the king of the army about to wage war, wisdom requires each to count the cost to, to, to determine if they can successfully accomplish the contemplated endeavor. The same sort of assessment should be made by one wishing to follow Christ. The discipleship will not be without uh, hardships, struggles, disappointments, and sacrifices. When one embarks on the Christian life, certain questions should be posed and answered. Question number one, am I willing to deny myself? Self-denial is the first condition of discipleship. Jesus said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 24. To deny one, oneself is to live no longer to please the self, but to please God. Jesus, when faced with the cup of his suffering, prayed, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew, the 26th chapter, verse 39, 42, and there are similar references to uh, Mark and Luke. Paul wrote that he had been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2, verse 20. He told the Colossian brethren that if then you were raised with Christ, seek the things which are above where Christ is, sitting on the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you died. Well, they were actually still living, but he said you died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, Colossians 3rd chapter, verses 1 through 5. The second question is, am I willing to abide by his teachings? Commitment to Jesus involves living by his laws, that is, obeying his commandments. Are you willing to be guided solely by his teachings? This is a vital part of the cost that must be counted. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, John uh, 14, verse 15, and also over, uh, verse 21. Will you keep his commandments, or will you replace them with commandments of men? In speaking to the scribes and Pharisees who had 
substituted traditions for the commandments of God. Jesus said, Hypocrites, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, not teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Matthew, the 15th chapter, verses 7 through 9, and similar passage in Mark. Of course, ascertaining commandments requires rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. If the word can be rightly divided, then it can also be wrongly divided. It requires much study and understanding of proper hermeneutical principles and an honesty of heart, such as possessed by the fair-minded Bereans, Acts 17, chapter verses 10 through 12. Third question, am I willing to follow him to the end. There are many people who are eager to follow Jesus if the way is easy and pleasant, but when the going gets tough and the road stretches long, they give up. In the parable of the sores, sometimes called the parable of the soils, the sea fell alternatively by the wayside and the birds came and defired them. Some fell on stony places where there was little soil to sustain them when they sprang up and were scorched by the sun. Others fell among thorns and were choked by them. Then some fell on good ground and yielded a bountiful crop. Jesus explained the parable in Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 19 through 23. Three of the soil types were not willing to follow Jesus, come what may. And you can read that passage on your own. Uh, I think probably you, you have quite often. The Christian way lasts until the crop is harvested. One comes to know something of the toil and its duration when he has counted the cost. Let's be honest with, our, with ourselves and face <clears throat> the facts of reality, or else enthusiasm at the onset of our Christian walk will end in despair. There is no challenge that compares to the Christian life and no thrill that exceeds the thrill of the Christian way. But dying with him and taking up his cross is not easy. We must forsake all, most of all, we must forsake ourselves. I hope this has been of uh, benefit to you. I uh, certainly want everyone to be joyous and joyful, but you also must be obedient. So we want to allow the opportunity for those who have not obeyed Christ to do so and for those who have uh, fallen by the wayside to regain gain the true and joyous path. We want to allow that opportunity now while we stand and sing.